This is dedicated to all my beautiful queens, all my beautiful ladies out there. She is a queen. Good queen. You got it, girl. She is a queen. You better represent. Go queen. Go queen. Go. She's a queen about her business. Queen. Working hard. Thank you guys for joining another episode of the Key Chat. I'm so happy to be back after recovering from surgery. I have a very special guest today, and her name is Miss Christina Johnson. Christina has a wonderful platform regarding self-love, self-forgiveness. She has a beautiful message that I'm so excited to hear about. And I just want to dive in, and Christina's going to tell us some more about herself. You may be familiar with her from the past show from VH1, Atlanta X's, but she has such a huge, huge platform that I'm just really excited to talk about. How are you doing today? I'm doing wonderful, Sharonda. Thank you for having me. This is amazing. I'm so happy to speak with you. As we were chatting before I hit record, like I said, you have us a lot of points that really speak to my heart about self-love and self-forgiveness and importantly, loving yourself for the first time because some people we assume when we're telling people to love themselves that they already you know have done it but some people even at our ages have not grasped that concept yet so i definitely can't wait for us to dive deeper but i wanted to start off with talking about your childhood because one of the journeys with self-love is i feel removing a lot of the scars from the little girls that we grew up because a lot of us adult women are those same little girls with those different scars. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to start off with asking you about your childhood and your upbringing. I know you have like some powerful things that you went through as yeah. a teen mother. I read that you were mm -hmm. a teen mom of a teen mom. So I definitely wanted yeah. to start off with just the growth that you've gone through and how did that shape you starting off? Well, okay, so I grew up, like you said, my mother was 16 when she got pregnant with me. I was 16 when I got pregnant with my daughter. So um, I believe in a thing, you know, not saying it was a curse because honestly, my daughter was a gift to me. But, you know, there are generational curses and things that we carry over from our grandparents, great grandparents and so forth. So my mom was a teen mom. I was a teen mom. I had my oldest daughter when I was 16, my second daughter when I was 19. Um, so we really grew up together. Um, but I grew up in a household that was, uh, it was very, there was a lot of domestic violence. And so I grew up not being nurtured and not loving myself. I thought I was hideous, to be honest with you. I didn't know what self-esteem was, what it meant. I didn't know what it was like to love myself and I didn't grow up in a household where that was nurtured. Um, so, and then my dad, he didn't claim me as a child um, because my mom chose not to be with him because he had other relationships. So I think to get back at her, he felt like, well, I won't be there for Christina, take that, but not thinking about what effect it would have on me. I think he was just thinking about her, you know, him getting back at her. So, of course, a lot of times as young people, we'll look for that male energy and um, we'll look for that love, what we feel like is love from all the wrong places, you know. So um, growing up promiscuous, uh, misunderstood, feeling unloved, although I know that my mom loved me, uh, my parents loved me, but it just was not healthy. They didn't really know how to love themselves. You know, they grow, grew up in toxic environments as well. And like I said, we carry on these different generational curses and unhealthy habits. Um, and then we raise our children with these same fears and conditioning and, you know, so on. So I kind of got swept up in that. And my stepdad, he wasn't really raised in a healthy household either. So these are adults as far as the age is concerned, but these are children in pain trapped in these adult bodies and they really don't know how to 
express themselves or how to love. Um, and I always say that with like so much conviction, we, the, first, the greatest lesson that we can teach our children is how to love through the way that we love in all of our relationships. That's not just a love relationship. That's the relationship with your parents, uh, your friends, kids are always watching. So they don't always do what you do. They do what you say. So I made a decision as a young mother, I'm going to raise my children even as a child. And when, as I learn, I will teach and I will try to live the example of woman for them so that if they do what I do and not what I say, then it won't be a situation where, you know, I've drifted so far off and repeating the same cycles that I saw. I felt like now I'm an adult, so I get to choose. And so I made different decisions growing up with them than what I saw, if that makes sense. That's a lot, you know, and you touched on a lot just based, just when you mentioned the self-esteem portion, and like you said, thinking you were hideous, so many women of color, and when I say women, women of color, I'm not trying to knock out any other, but you know, just from Understood, my own yeah. experiences, you know, women of color, you know, sometimes we just grow up just not even thinking that we're beautiful, Yes. you know, and that sounds like to somebody else, mm -hmm. but for someone to carry that and just to think that they're not beautiful, it leads into thinking you're not worthy, yes. you're not valuable, you don't deserve anything, you know, right. and you're seeing yourself through a distorted, cracked lens. You know, we all grow up in this beauty, but, you know, we only knew then what we knew now. But when we look at ourselves as young girls and just having that feeling like I'm ugly, I'm not yeah. beautiful, that starts a whole different trail mm -hmm. of heartache alone. And yeah. then, as you mentioned, if you're in an environment where you may not be being told that, hey, I love you, that's more wounds that are getting bigger and bigger and as you yes. said it leads to promiscuity it leads to us mm -hmm. having that hurt when we become mothers too because mm -hmm. a lot of us you know when we become mothers we're so excited because we look at it like okay this is a chance to start over and we yeah. want to start over via, via our children mm -hmm. but sometimes we start over the pain we went through with absolutely <laughs> you know yeah. and that part that really hurts mm -hmm. as a mother because i know you mentioned you had two daughters Mm -hmm. How was that, you know, because you're trying to heal yourself yes. and also give love to your children, but also not give them any past pain. So yeah. raising girls, how was it for you mothering girls, you know, with everything that you'd experienced? Right. So now I have two girls and a son. He's the youngest. But my girls, you just have so much fear that oh my God, I don't want them to do make the same mistakes I did. I don't want to raise them the way I was raised. So a lot of it was fear-based initial, initially. And I did a lot. I was more of a disciplinarian because that's what I saw. Mm -hmm. um, it took me a while to really realize these are human beings who get it, right? So I don't have to be perfect. Initially, I was very much, oh, I got to take them to church. I got to be perfect in their eyes. I can't do this, can't do that. And then as they got older, um, I started saying tweens, you know, I was like, well, you just have to keep it real with these kids. Cause I started seeing that what they talk about in school, like will blow your mind. A lot of things we don't feel like they know, they know. Cause even growing up as kids, we saw a lot that our parents did probably didn't realize we were privy to, but we heard a lot in the household, you know? So growing up with girls, I think my number one was, I don't want them getting pregnant at 16. It was my biggest goal. Like, I do not want to break. I mean, I do not want to keep this cycle. I want to break it. So I remember my oldest daughter and I saying, we're not generational curse makers. We're generational curse breakers. And so it was a situation where I tried my best to teach them to be open with them. Because see, that was something that I didn't have too. I got molested when I was little and I didn't have anyone to talk to about it. I couldn't, I felt, I can't tell my mom she's going to blame me. You know, she's going to say it's my fault or, you know, my stepdad may kill him. Now I have to live. And I'm young thinking this way, right? So with my kids, I was like, I don't want there to be anything that happens that we can't talk about, right? 
or you know, if anybody looks at them inappropriately or touches them inappropriately, I want to create an environment where they can come tell me. Mm-hmm. Um, it's crazy because I was listening to an interview the other day with Oprah and the creator of the Me Too movement. Mm-hmm. And she was saying a way to get kids to talk about it is to let them know that, you know, that you're safe with me. You know that you can tell me, you know, anything and I'm, it's not going to change my love for you. And see, when I was coming up and raising my girls, I was very much like, if somebody put their hands on you, touch you inappropriately, let me know if they threaten to hurt me, they can't. I'm here. I'll do whatever it is to protect you. But that was such a beautiful statement that she made instead of saying, they can't hurt me. I, you know, let me know, saying that no matter what you what happens i'm not gonna stop loving you it's not gonna change my love for you no matter what you what happens i'm not gonna stop loving you it's not gonna change my love for you because a lot of times when we go through that we blame ourselves right we think i shouldn't have did this or i shouldn't have maybe because of this or maybe because of that not realizing this is a older teenager or an adult who knows better you know, who's been plotting on me. It's not my fault. But as a young person, I just felt like, oh my God, what am I going to do? So raising my girls, I was very much vocal with them, very much keeping it real with them, very much I want to hear what's going on. And sometimes that caused me to hear things I didn't want to hear, but I'd rather hear them than not. So it was a situation where I tried my best to create an environment that felt safe. Because I'd never had that. I'd never mm-hmm. had the safety of knowing I could say anything or do anything and the love for me wouldn't change. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was beautiful. Um, yeah, so raising girls, it was it was tough because I wanted them to be better than me. Mm-hmm. And I felt like these lives are in my hands. So I don't want to disappoint God, you know, in the way that I'm raising them. I put a lot of pressure on myself. And I tell parents all the time, had I known ne- then what I know now, I would tell parents, don't even worry so much. Mm-hmm. They came here to have this journey. They came through you to get these lessons and they're going to be just fine. Mm-hmm. But we're always like, you can't go, you can't do this, you can't. And it's like, oh my gosh, you know, like I have, I want, I wanted them to have the freedom to be themselves. So by the time my son came around, I was like, I just want to see what's genuinely you. But it took mm-hmm. me, it took me a while to get there. Right. Sure. And, you know, and I've gone through a similar violation as a young person. And mm-hmm. I think that's what adds the extra anxiety and the pressure because you're already having this issue with the self-esteem where you like you said you think you're not beautiful you think you're hideous you know we're already looking down upon ourselves then a violation you're embarrassed you know and again you already don't feel that you're valuable or worthy so it just adds Mm -hmm. more to just not having any type of self-worth and you're embarrassed and you're ashamed so i know like for me as a mother i always have this extra anxiety like thinking everybody was the boogeyman, you know? So then you want to raise your children as if you're playing like the floor is lava. Like you can't touch anything. Yes, (laughs) it's true. And it's naturally what they do. Like kids touch, they explore, but we like, no, don't touch that. No, don't do this. We're so afraid to really allow them to just be. You know what I mean? Sometimes it can be a lot. And like, we grew up like that. Like, don't touch this. You better not do that. Don't sit on nobody's lap. Like, they were talking about that in the interview. And I was like, oh, my God. I mean, we grew up with all the rules on what not to do and what not to be that when things did happen, we felt bad. We felt guilty. We felt responsible. Mm -hmm. We were just being young people, young kids, you know, um, children. And so I think it's really important for parents to give the, their children enough freedom to be themselves. Now we're here for guidance. We're yeah. here for correction. If you need that, that's fine. Um, but for sure, allow them to have a voice. Right. Because I know growing up, we always heard, shut your mouth. Don't talk back. You better not do this. You better not. And it's like, you didn't have the freedom to speak. So I remember one of my friends calling me after an interview I had done and said, why do you always apologize for... Mm-hmm speaking too long or speaking too much. 
And I'm like, I think it's because I always was told to hush or to shut up or don't talk back to me and don't say this. You know, it wasn't too too afraid to ask. It was just so many elements of you can't just be you. And so that I tried to not do that with my kids. Like, okay, let me hear you out. Even though they, I remember them saying, you're not a good listener. I was like, I'm a great listener. But you're sometimes we're listening to respond mm -hmm. instead of listening to really hear. Right. right. So yeah, that's a big thing too. Um, just the patience that it takes, mm -hmm. to be a mom, you know, and like you said, yes, we do look down on ourselves. And then once something like that happens and you're victimized, I think the little girl in you comes up to protect you even in situations where you may not need her. So we grow, we have to grow through a lot. We have to go through a lot, but we have to grow through a lot. Right. And um, just being able to handle this life, you know what I mean? And be okay with not being okay, mm. you know? And then as we're being raised, sometimes it's like be seen and not heard, but it's like, well, then how am I supposed to tell you things? Or... Mm then some people do say something and then they're not protected. Right. You know what I mean? And then it bleeds over into their adulthood. They don't trust. Somebody comes into their life and have to pay like, yeah. because they don't know real loyalty and they don't feel safe with anybody. So, you know, if the relationship isn't really negative, and bad for you, you'll sabotage it when it's good because you're not used to being treated well, or you're not used to, you know, someone having your back. So you could be a runner, you know what I mean? So this stuff, like you go through so many things to try to heal that little girl in you. And then imagine raising other little girls while you're trying to heal. And this little girl coming up for, for you feeling like she's saving you when really, you know, doing the healing work I've learned. Okay. I got it. I can have the difficult conversations. You know, I can talk for myself, you know what I mean? Because my thing was to cave, cave, you know, like cave myself in, cage myself in. I wouldn't speak. I call it the bubble. So I surrounded mm -hmm. myself with this bubble, this invisible bubble that protected me. So I could just be quiet, like not talk to anybody for like days, weeks at a time. And I felt like I was protecting myself. But like I, I, the Bible says to guard your heart. And I think guarding, like if you have a guard at the door, they can let the good people in. They can let mm -hmm. the good people, you know, bad people out. They, mm -hmm. They're guarding the door. Right. But if you block the door, mm -hmm. put locks on the door, <laughs> nothing's getting in. So right. as much as you're protecting the bad stuff from getting in, you're also keeping the good stuff out. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And you're not able to freely love because you have it all trapped inside. Nobody can get it mm -hmm. because you're blocking love from coming in and you're blocking yourself from giving love out. It's a difference between blocking and guarding, in my opinion. And so, you know, going through different traumas, whatever your traumas were, some people didn't go through molestation. You know, some people went through physical abuse, verbal abuse, whatever your traumas were. It sometimes stagnates us in life because we can't get past that pain. And I think a lot of times we put conditioning is a big thing. So we've been conditioned to believe you're my mom, you're my dad. You're supposed to show up in my life perfect, feed me, clothe me in the nicest things. We're supposed to be, you know, this super de duper perfect family. And no, we didn't. We didn't make the agreements to come here through our parents for perfect experiences. We came here to learn, which mm -hmm. means if you chose me as your mom to have these experiences and I showed up imperfect, your soul needed that. Your soul mm -hmm. needed that lesson. It came here to grow in a certain way and return to God with everything that it gained and learned to share, right? Mm -hmm. But a lot of times we give up because we don't feel like we can handle it when we absolutely can. Mm -hmm. Um, but it gets really, really tough. And so for me, being a life coach, um, loving on people, I think it's because I've experienced pain and hurt, disappointment and betrayal at such a big degree that I've never want anybody else to feel it. Right. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it 
for me too, as a young person was people pleasing, even as an adult. Yes. yes. I want to fix it. I want to pay for it. I want to save it. I want to protect it. Whatever you got going on, I become the superhero for it. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of pressure, right? A lot. So many things that you mentioned from just the cultural things that we have to unlearn, right? Yes. You know, because we grow up in environments where, like you said, you talk too much, mm -hmm. you be quiet. You're not supposed to say that. Respect your elders. Doesn't yes. matter if you're being totally disrespected. Yes. Just respect them. You know, as mm -hmm. girls, oh, that's not ladylike. That's you know, right. a young woman is not supposed to do this. So again, you're already being conditioned that you're not supposed to express your feelings. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to keep it a secret. Yes. You're not supposed to say, hey, I don't like this. Mm -hmm. This didn't make me feel good. This makes me unhappy. You're not allowed to say those things. That's how we're brought up. And then, yeah. as you mentioned too, with blocking things right yes you have i'm a i'm definitely a recovering people pleaser <laughs> recovering yes. things right yes you have i'm a i'm definitely a recovering people pleaser <laughs> recovering yes people pleasers you know we have once we get out of that we begin to have knee-jerk reactions, right? Because mind yes. you, our radar is a little, you know, I think it peaks a little higher when you recover from people pleasing. So yes. you end up picking on hints, I think, a little earlier than the average person because you don't want to go back to that part of your life where you let certain things hurt you longer than they should have, you know? So yes. sometimes you get to the point now, once you've gotten out of that people pleasing stage, it's like, Oh, wait a minute. I'm starting to get a bad feeling. So like you said, you lock that door, you put the deadbolt on, that's it. <laughs> and again, yep. and so, but like you said, the problem with that is you're so guarded that you also miss out on some people who really aren't trying to hurt you. Yes. Some relationships that could be healthy for you. It's really hard to the point where it's like, how can I figure out if this is going to feel good, if it's not going to feel good, because you don't want to get hurt again. <laughs> you that's know, you right. Know, Come from that defensive mode. You've been violated in the past. I heard of people pleasing comes with so many repercussions, you know, because Absolutely. it lets in the wrong people. So we do have to protect our energy. So I think that's the, I think that's the optical course through life. <laughs> it is. It really you is. Know? A lot of us go through it. It's crazy. Right. Um, and then you feel guilty for putting yourself first, but it's an absolute must. I cannot show up, like I said, as the hero, which isn't healthy. You know what I mean? You have to be discerned on how to move, but I can't show up for you, whether it be your kids, your boss, your man, your woman, your whatever. And I, if I'm depleted, I have no reservoir. Like I have to make sure that I'm good first. And a lot of people who are people, people pleasers put themselves on the back burner. It's the kids, mm -hmm. it's my man, it's my girl, it's my job before everything. You know what I'm saying? Like before myself. And then by the time I get to me, there's only crumbs left. I have no mm -hmm. energy. You know, my energy is zapped. I haven't protected myself you know, my energy or anything. Like, I think it's so important that we take care of ourselves first and it's, and to know that it's not selfish to do that. Right. right. To know that if I'm energetic, if I'm healthy, if I feel good, then I can give you the best of me, which mm -hmm. is why I take time for affirmations, prayer, Yoga. I love hot yoga. I love to sweat. I'm going to go to the sweat house here in Atlanta. We have this place where you can go. It's like a dry sauna with chromotherapy. You can listen to YouTube. I meditate in there when I go. My meditation mm -hmm. is so important to me. In the morning when I get up, my praise. You know, I get up, I do my praise music, and I let God know I'm thankful for just another opportunity to do things better today than I did yesterday, right? And so once I start, that's my fuel, right? And I go off of that for the rest of the day. It's like, okay, so now I have a full tank, right? And mm -hmm. as I'm just earned, I can... I can give whatever needs to be given as long as I know that I'm discerned. So back in the day, I used to just fix it, fix it. And still, it, it still dwells within me. So I have to check myself because some things become a habit, right? Um, or an addiction to us. You know, it makes you feel good to be the hero. So you're going to fix it, save it, you know, do whatever you have to do to protect it. 
um, and not make sure that you're good. So I have to go back and say, hey, what have you done for yourself? I have to go to the gym. So whether I'm eating well or not, I still have to like take care, get my blood flowing. You know what I mean? And then that's another thing. Am I eating well? Am I taking care of myself? Yes. Um, it's such a biggie for me as well. So like they, they say that pour, you know, fill your own cup and whatever runs over is yours to give away, but don't mm -hmm. empty your cup, right? Just make sure you're taking care of yourself first and it's okay. It really is okay. And it took me a long time as a people pleaser to understand that you don't have to, sometimes I feel like we can get in God's way right? Because the best things that we, the best lessons we've learned, right? The best, uh, our resilience, our strength and all that stuff comes from trial, not trial and error, trial, test. You can't even spell testimony without first spelling test. It's the first four letters. Like, so you have to go through some stuff to become resilient, right? That's where the good stuff lies. So imagine somebody fixing it every time, and you don't go through anything. That was me. Like, oh, I'll fix it. I'll fix it. And you get in God's way. And he has a way sometimes of just moving you up out of the way. So you have to be careful yes. with that too. Because, you know, that whole analogy, give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. Teach him how to fish, he'll eat for a lifetime is a real thing, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Putting the mask on yourself before anybody else. You put it on them, you pass out. Like, what good is that? You can't even save yourself or anybody else because you're helping other people and you can't even breathe. Mm -hmm. It just does not make sense. You have to do for you first. And people that love you should understand that. They don't always understand it, but you don't have to explain, right? When you need me, I'm able to be here for you because. I've taken care of myself. Mm -hmm. So you can't have a problem with me taking care of myself or you can, that's your issue, but I have to take care of me first. And mm -hmm. like I said, that's a selfless act because I'm taking care of me so that I can give to you. That to me, that's selfless. It's not selfish at all. Um, and just understanding to me also, I think that discernment is such a big deal because sometimes you can clearly hear, don't do it, but we'll do it anyway. Then you have to pay for the repercussions of being disobedient to yourself, like your soul, because you know you heard. Mm. It's not a good idea. Yes. But you want to fix it. You want people, you want people to like you. You want people to love you. Mm -hmm. And that's where I feel like that self-love should automatically kick in. Mm -hmm. Because when you love yourself, if somebody doesn't care for you, you really don't care. Like it can feel bad. Like, oh, well, you know, I don't know what I did to them. It could be uncomfortable, but it's not going to stop me from living, loving, honoring people, hugging on people, healing, you know, allowing God to heal through me. It's not going to stop any of that. That's your stuff. Mm -hmm. So we have to be clear on letting people have their stuff, mm -hmm. right? and not allowing their stuff to become your stuff. Because I have so many people that I love on, I don't even have the energy for one person to take that much out of me, mm -hmm. right? If you love me, then you must respect that this is the way that I'm moving. If you know me, then you know that I'm moving in love, right? Mm -hmm. So you know that my intentions are always good, even if I have to say no, right? Because mm -hmm. everything's working in the background for our good, especially when it doesn't feel like it. And I'm not getting in the way of that for you. So if something in my soul says no, then the answer is no. I don't care who else thinks what, what their opinions are, because I trust in the most high so much that I know when he discerns me, it's clear. Mm -hmm. It's clear. Mm -hmm. But you know something that you mentioned too, and I definitely wanted to touch on self-forgiveness, but I'll push it up earlier because like you mentioned, our discernment tells us a lot of times before that trouble hits, it's in the back of our mind, like this doesn't feel good. I shouldn't say yes to this, you know? But again, like you said, when you come from just having that low self-esteem or dealing with any, any people pleasing or just any stage in your life where you felt less than, 
even though something in the back of your mind, you feel that it's off, again, you want to be liked. You want to be loved. And it makes you sometimes, like you said, get that superwoman complex. So it's like, I can change this. I'm so great and so powerful now because, you know, again, we want to fight that imposter syndrome as well. So it's like, you know what? I can do this. Even though you're getting that tingle telling you not to do it. So then whether it's a bad relationship or just anything that may not have worked out, instead of giving ourselves that grace that, hey, I just was trying to be a good person, we start beating ourselves up. Absolutely. You know? And then me personally, just coming from a domestic violence situation, I went through years of just having some serious guilt, like, you should have known better. And I have so many people mm-hmm. telling me, well, hey, if only you had known better, you knew better. <laughs> it's like you're beating yourself up for being human. You know, yeah. we're not on this earth to be perfect. But mm-hmm. again, we struggle with that self-forgiveness. What is your take on, because you already touched on it, because so many of us, especially women our age, you know, 40 plus, we're trying to heal. You know, this is a new age now where people are being more, I feel, steadfast and more Mm -hmm. active to say, hey, I want to heal. You know, I want to break some generational Mm -hmm. curses or cultural upbringings that I had where I wasn't supposed to talk. I want to speak up now. I want to talk. But we're dealing with a lot of guilt. We just can't forgive ourselves or love ourselves. Yes. What do you tell that woman who she really has that desire to heal, but that 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 pain that was they can't forgive themselves is hindering yeah. them. It's hurting them. It's like a cancer. Like, what is your take on that? Because that is what holds a lot of people back from being the best version that they can be at themselves. Yeah, they can't forgive themselves. They have so much guilt and pain and shame too. Yes, they do. I think a lot of yes. they can't forgive themselves. They have so much guilt and pain and shame too. Yes, they do. I think a lot of it for me, I'm a connect the dots person, right? So I go back to my childhood. I go back to the things that I went through as a young person to try to figure out where did that, the stem of that come from, right? Why would I get involved with a men or a man that is abusive. And I think a lot of it is us wanting to be punished, us feeling like we deserve to be punished for something, right? Mm-hmm. And for me, I remember as a child, we were, my dad's family owned a tire and body shop. So I would drive, we would ride past there. I would see his other kids out there and think, well, what's wrong with me? Why am I not enough? Why am I not invited? You know, and I started feeling like, well, it must be me. It must be something. I did or, you know, I, I'm i not enough, you know what I mean? So I think growing up, it kind of just felt like, why am I not good enough? Why am I not accepted? And I think over time, I just started feeling like I deserved punishment just like me not being invited there was like punishment, right? So then you're not in your conscious mind thinking that way subconsciously just over what you've seen and how you've grown up and the things that have happened to you, you feel like, oh, well, maybe I'm not good enough to be there. So then you settle for people that aren't healthy. You create these trauma bonds, you know, Mm -hmm. like attracts like. So a lot of times, even if you're not a bad person, you may attract something that happened to them in their childhood to something that happened in your childhood. Now you guys are bonding together. Nobody comes up to you and just clocks you over the head and and is like, oh, I'm going to abuse you, but hey, how you doing? You want to go out? And you're like, yeah, no, it doesn't happen like that. They build you up just to tear you down. And so over time that happens. I think with me, I just felt like enough is enough. I just got to the point where it was like, you don't deserve this. You're not even being yourself anymore. Who are you really? And how do you start this healing journey? Right? So um, I remember being in a car with a friend of mine and looking at them and they were looking at me with so much love, so much admiration and adoration that I felt like, oh, I want to feel that way about myself. Right? Mm -hmm. So over time, I started to spend more time with myself because obviously I'm lovable. You know, I'm funny. Somebody thinks I'm cool to hang out with. So how do I get to the point where I can smile at myself this way? Right. Mm -hmm. So I started taking myself out on dates like I would take myself to brunch once a week. I would go take myself to a movie 
by myself and started spending time with myself. And I remember kicking it off at a spa here in Atlanta. It's a hotel and winery called Chateau Alain, but they have a spa house here where you can go get spa services. You can go to dinner, breakfast, lunch in your robe. And they had theme rooms and I would always stay in this Greek room. And I just went in there, started writing. Um, and I just remember staying there for like a week, right? And just doing self-work. And then after that, I just said, from now on, you're going to do something every week, no matter how small it is, no matter how big it is, to show yourself that you love yourself. And though, so I started doing that, the affirmation, speaking those things that are not as though they were. That's the definition of faith. Manifestation is doing the same thing. It's like I'm speaking life. I'm a New York Times bestselling author. I'm a speaker. I'm loving. I'm kind. I would get uh, affirmations and quotes from other people. Uh, Oprah got one from Maya Angelou that says, people can't hold a candle to the light that God has given me. I know who I am now. I am God's child. And really feeling it. At first, when I was doing it, it was kind of like, oh, you know, it didn't feel genuine. But over time, I started to really feel it, believe it, honor it, honor myself, my journey, accept myself, accept the things that I've been through, and then work through that stuff to try to create not only a better life and existence for me, but for my children and everybody around me. Because like I said before, when you're a person who have been, who's been through so much pain, so much hurt, so much trauma and betrayal, the last thing you want to see is other people go through that. So me being able to put a smile on my children's face, now my grandchildren's faces, my friends, my lover, my it makes me happy to see them happy. And that's how I live my life. I live my life now the way I wish, you know, I could have experienced it as a child. I, I create the environment for my children and grandchildren to have that, that love, that security, um, me honoring them. When my kids or grandkids walk in the room, you would think, whoever your favorite person that Oprah came in or <laughs> Beyonce came in or whoever your person is. Cause it's like, I always want them to feel that they're special to somebody. Like it means something that you exist in this world and see, mm -hmm. I didn't have that. So I do everything in my power to create that for not only my family, but my friends, my friends are my family. I don't look at it no different. Mm -hmm. Um, for my lover, for my, you know, for my grandbabies, I try to create environments or little surprises or what have you um, that make them feel honored and special and loved and accepted and protected. Because I know for me, that's a biggie. I'm a Taurus. I love security. I love feeling protected. I love feeling honored. So I think I get so much love now because... Mm -hmm. I've given out so much of it, but I didn't have it young. So I honor it and appreciate it, right? So much that it feels like because I went so many years without it, that now God has given me such an abundance of it. And I'm mm -hmm. grateful for that, right? And so I, I'm very intentional in my movement, in my words, in my energy, very intentional in my hugs. Mm -hmm. um, I remember going to Jamaica recently for a friend of mine, uh, Chef Trigay, she got married and uh, her best friend's mom, I had given her a hug and she was like, the next day she was like, your hugs are so healing. Like you can heal through your hurt. I can feel the energy. She was like, if you could just open a place to, where you just give hugs. And I thought that would be a beautiful, would that not be the most beautiful thing? Like, do you know how much a hug can change the course of not just someone's day, but of their life? Do you know how many people have gone through a lifetime without it? Like as a young, like a kid, we didn't, we didn't, have, we weren't affectionate. And, you know, my mom, she didn't say she loved us and hugged us and she didn't grow up with it. You know, it's like, you, it's hard for people to give what they didn't have. Right. So I don't fault for her for that. It just wasn't a place a comfortable place for her. And it wasn't something that she knew, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So just imagine someone who never gets hugs. Mm. Right. Just to melt into your arms for, for just that few seconds of feeling the energy of love and care, right? That, that's everything. Now to me, 
that's true wealth, right? Mm -hmm. Loving, honoring, caring for a person, just giving them a few minutes of that good energy. Like that's, that's wealth to me. Mm. I'm, I'm super wealthy. <laughs> so, I'm super wealthy. All that other stuff is going to come. Just live a happy, genuine life, man. That's what this is about. I don't want to waste this journey. I'm trying to use every heartbeat for something special. And when I get mm. back to the most high, I'm going to be like, I used everything you gave me. I'm coming back empty. Yeah, because you've given me so many gifts. I want to be a little bit of like my design partners here. After we're done, we're going to design some stuff. I love being creative. I feel like that's so close to the most high. Like that lets me know he dwells within me because I have an eye for beautiful things. I can put beautiful things together. We have a company called Design My Investment. Me and Felia mm -hmm. Carter, and we make spaces beautiful, whether it's commercial, you know, um, a residential. Um, and I just love it in every aspect of my life, the way we dress. Um, mm -hmm. When we go somewhere to do design, they're always like, well, I can tell y'all design is, I mean, we fly. And so mm -hmm. my adornments, I'm starting a company called Jamila Jahari, where I'm going to sell accessories, chokers, bracelets, necklaces, ear cuffs, like all the cool stuff that I love to wear, thumb rings, toe rings, ankle bracelets, because that's where we come from. We're from, we mm -hmm. are descendants of kings and queens. And in everything yeah. I do, I want to promote that, to show that, to love that. And to me, everything, there's praise in everything, right? So we think that we're just these bodies. Yes, this is a loner, right? I'm so mm -hmm. much bigger than this, right? <laughs> so I want to feed, uh, feed my spirit. I want to share my spirit and my love with people. But even in the expression of the way that I dress or how I might wear a bendy or rings or that to me is praise. I am grateful for this vessel. I am grateful for my home. And like mm -hmm. I would clean my house just to, and play gospel music, just to be thankful for the fact that God has given me a beautiful dwelling, right? A beautiful space that is all me, right? And just the way that I carry myself in my walk, I want to be grateful. I want to yeah. be, I want to praise in everything that I do because I am so grateful just to be here, I battled mm -hmm. Graves' disease. I almost lost my life from complications. I'm so grateful just to be here. I battled mm -hmm. Graves' disease. I almost lost my life from complications mm -hmm. of Graves. I almost died. Mm -hmm. And the doctors were describing my death to me, how my kidneys were going to fail, how I was going to go into emergency surgery, how I was going to go into cardiac arrest because I had these tumors that were pushing my kidneys and organs out of the way. And I was I was wearing maternity clothes, but I was 130 pounds and I'm five, seven. That's tiny. Right. So. I started dying. And then I remember, and it's crazy because I always tell this story about Ricky Smiley, but when I met him, we went on his show one day. I didn't even get to tell him, but I remember taking my son to school and Ricky mm -hmm. Smiley had the morning show and he would be on there and he would play gospel. Then he would have Pastor Haynes come on and say something. And I remember I grew up in a small church in North Carolina. So we used to pray and speak in tongues. And then somebody across the church would interpret the tongues, but I didn't know how to interpret tongues. I just was like, that's amazing. But I remember this more that morning, this particular morning, driving up in my driveway, listening to Pastor Haynes, praying, speaking in tongues. And then I remember it, interpreting the tongue. And I remember God saying, no matter how bad, no, this is what he said first. This is nothing compared to what I'm about to give you. Wow. And he was like, but no matter how bad things get, stand on my promises, mm -hmm. right? So then I get sick, right? Mm -hmm. And I, they tell me I have Graves' disease. I need to find an internist. We can't touch you, you know, move, remove these tumors. I instantly started dying. I was losing mm -hmm. weight. I was sick. And I just remember... 
coming from the doctor's office, I, I had to go every week. They had to take blood and all this stuff. And I remember I would cry every time and I would be in my car and I would be crying, please God, why I'm going to die, you know, this and all of this, they're saying this. And I remember hearing God just as clear as I'm talking to you, no joke said, are you going to believe the word of man or are you going to stand on my promises? Wow. It took me all the way back to that day when I heard Ricky Smiley and I was speaking in tongues and he said, no matter how bad it gets, stand on my promises. Mm -hmm. And I remember from that day, I remember crying, I'm going to stand on your promises. And I just kept saying, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you for my healing. Thank you for my life. Thank you for everyone that's praying for me who's never prayed. People were like, I've never prayed before. I'm going to pray for you. I've been praying for you. If anything happened to you, I'm going to stop believing. I remember my friend Kanique was like, we're getting on the phone at this time. I put together a prayer call. It was so many ministers, all her minister friends. And it was so many um, prophetess and prophets mm -hmm. Just praying for me. But what I felt like was I was just a sacrificial lamb to bring people closer to the most high, but also show them the healing power that he still has today. Right. Mm -hmm. So I was able to be on my deathbed and make Jesus popular again or bring people to God. Like, yeah. and it felt amazing. I'm not going to lie. I just kept saying, thank you. Thank you. That's how I know gratitude is such an amazing tool. I sell these um, gratitude. They're called mustard seed necklaces, right? Because mm -hmm. if you have faith as tiny as a mustard, have you seen a mustard seed plant grow? It's mm -hmm. huge. It comes from this tiny little seed and it grows so much. What I realized was me being ill wasn't about me. Right. It was about the journey to show people that God is real. He still has mm -hmm. healing power. Gratitude is powerful. Right. My faith grew in it, in that. Right. So I was able to have other people have, you know, show them faith and how you can get through trusting. Right. So I started making these little mustard seed necklaces as a reminder of how powerful our faith is. Um, and so that situation grew me so much. Like my faith grew. My health is amazing. There's no cure for graves. I don't have it though. You know, you can get your, it to get your thyroid taken out. I was like, no, I tried to do um, radiation. It didn't work for me. And then it just balanced itself. It's been years. I've never had to take a thyroid replacement pill. I haven't had to do any of that. What I know is healing power is real, but it can't happen without your belief, right? Mm -hmm. You've got to believe that you can be well and not even be well. Let me say this. The definition of faith, again, is speaking those things that are not as though they were, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to believe it's done. Now, ask, if you say, okay, God already did it, why would you have to get on your knees and pray for him to do it? If it's done... Just thank him. Start praising now and be grateful. Mm -hmm. See yourself as well. Run and jump and kick and scream and like. And I remember some days I would be in the gym. I go to this cool gym here in Atlanta called Effect Fitness, right? I would be jumping around and I would just start crying. Remembering mm -hmm. a time where I had debilitating fevers. They were called thyroid storms. The mm -hmm. fever would go up to like 105 and I couldn't walk. Ugh. My son was nine. He was trying to help me get to the bathroom. I could barely walk. I was so tiny. Now I'm jumping around in this gym. I had no choice but to feel gratitude, right? Because what I know for sure is that if you, if you thank him in advance, it's done. If you praise him in advance, it's done. Be upset for what? Stress for what? And please, y'all, for the love of God, stop talking about it all the time. Like, mm -hmm. we have a habit of just wanting in conversation to talk about our illnesses and our horrible times. And the, thing, the only reason that I'm writing a book is coming out this summer, right? And it's my story. And the only reason I'm telling it is because I know it's going to heal many. Other than that, it's just a story. Stop telling folks unless you're using it as a guideline for how you made it to the other side. Yes. Because what I know for sure is if you stay stuck, 
that's where you're going to be. You're going to stay stuck in this stagnant place. I see myself as well in a loving, healthy, loving marriage relationship with all my kids and grandkids running around and, you know, sharing wisdom and love. And I see greatness. I don't, I don't stay stuck in what could have, should have been, right? I'm moving forward happily, lovingly, kindly, you know, enjoying and loving life. Mm. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. You just really have such a powerful journey that you've experienced. And, you know, you said something very important because obviously we want to share our stories, but I think there's a balance between sharing your story to help someone heal, mm -hmm. but also we want to speak life. You know, so, and you just said a whole testimony, you know, like, sure. yeah, we, we're going to share our stories, but we're also going to speak life because if you just do this whole, woe is me and mm -hmm. let me share with someone why I'm having such a miserable time yes. or why I went through hell, but you yeah. don't give them the end of the rainbow. I got to hear the pot of gold yes. <laughs> with that story. Like, you know what I'm saying? If yes, you don't absolutely. Gold, all you've done is do, you've just done some more self and you've just passed on some negative energy you yep. know like I don't I, I just I don't hold on to energy I just feel like none of us should and you know like I just like I said I just think there's something so powerful what you said you know like we're going to share that story but we're not going to share we're not going to pass on and regurgitate that negative energy and that's yes. a balance, you know because we all have been through some things we've all, we all have our process to bear. Absolutely. But you got to sell that pot of gold. Because <laughs> if you don't sell that pot of gold, again, you're just bringing the next person down. But I think we all need to be mindful when we share our story, sell yes. them that rainbow and sell them yeah. the pot of gold at the end because the pain does not last forever. It may feel like it. Mm -hmm. And when you're going through it, it's Ooh, like yes. ever going to end. Yeah. You know? But the beautiful part of it is that it, does get better especially when you speak life and you give god his glory and his praise when we come out of it you know god is selfish in a sense you know he's yeah. saying, like i want my praise out of the story right. i just saved you you know and he does it because he loves us obviously but what better way to thank him and to show him how much we adore him and love right. him like you didn't have to save me you didn't have to get right. me out that health crisis you didn't have to pull me out of that abusive relationship when everybody kept telling me don't go back you know you okay. didn't have to when you, you know? hit and you stuck in there anyway just <laughs> you didn't have to out. <laughs> it's like so let me yeah. thank you like me singing and this is our way that we can adore him. We can sing and give him his praises oh, by giving that story. But again, like I said, if we don't have that pot of gold, mm -hmm. you know, we're not letting the story do what it's supposed to do. Yes. You know, like you said, testimony does have a test in it. Girl. But we have to do our part in giving that testimony and understanding. And that's the part, part, part two. But again, we're not supposed to lean on our understanding. But having that understanding once we get out of it, you mm -hmm. know, because when you're in the thick of it, like, again, like I said, it's like, oh, why is this happening? Yeah. You know? I don't think anyone's that mature, like, when they're going through something terrible to say, oh, well, you know what? I know this illness and this bad marriage and my financial problems. It's fine. I just, you know, help yeah. everybody. Like, no, at the time, you're like, why is this happening to me? To me, you know? yay. But once it's over, you look back at it like, Thank you, God. <laughs> and then over time, being that I grew up in abuse and had sexual abuse, I've been raped and all this stuff. After over time, after you see God bring you out so many times, abuse and had sexual abuse, I've been raped and all this stuff. After over time, after you see God bring you out so many times, you get to the point where it's not that you don't feel. Yeah, but you can speak victory over yourself immediately. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Because what it taught me is it don't matter what the doctors say. God has the final word. He has yeah. the final say so. And a lot of times it ain't final. What you mm -hmm. feel is your final di diagnosis or destination is not it. It's really a choice. That's what my book is about choices, because mm -hmm. really our perspective is so important. How you see things, how you think about things is everything. So it's important to make sure that you're speaking life. A lot of times we just talking. If you listen to a lot of stuff you say, it's so cliche and it's stuff that you've mm -hmm. heard over the years, over and over and over. And now you're saying it and it's not even healthy. 
I don't like when people say it's always something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, well, if you say that, that's what it is. I always say, well, it is what you say it is. So if it's always something negative, it's always going to be something negative. You know what I'm saying? So having uh, the awareness, like I said, everything is about your intention. I heard Oprah say that recent, like um, your, the intention you put out is what you get back. Yes. So I've been like repeating that with my book, like my intention is to heal or mm -hmm. allow God to heal through me. He's the healer. I'm the vessel. My intention is to show love. My intention is to show, like you said, the pot of gold on the other side. You know what I mean? Not just the rain, not just the storm, but girl, when the sun come out after the storm, we know we go outside. We're like, oh, we can just bask in the beauty of all that is. But that storm is a real thing. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Be in it, but speak life over it. Because one thing we know is that it is not going to storm or rain always. Things can't grow without sunshine. And we have more mm -hmm. sunny days a lot of times than rainy days. But sometimes we're the reason for them, the mm -hmm. rainy days, right? Because of the things that we say, it's creating our tomorrow. So be mindful of your words. Like, you know, we have this thing, Marco Polo, me and my friends get on and we talk or whatever. And sometimes we'll get on there early in the morning, he'll stand it straight up and be like, oh, I look a hot mess. And we promised each other. Now we don't do that. We don't speak down to ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, girl, I know my hair's standing up, but I'm still fly. You know, just trying to always find something like my friend Braley always says, uh, yeah, so <laughs> we don't kill anything. You know, you'd be like, you killed that. We don't do mm -hmm. that. We don't want to kill right. anything. We give it life. That's what we do. Yeah. We're mm -hmm. life givers. We're manifestors. We're, we birth things. You know, we make people. Come on, ladies. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Even if you haven't experienced that, it's so many children that need our support and help and love and so many people that we're nurturers by nature, mothers in ways, even if we haven't birthed any children, we are givers of life. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So like bask in your strength, in your, in your being a queen, in your love, like all things good. It's a choice. Yes. I can be just as messy, petty, do horrible things like everybody else. Like Maya Angelou says, like we're all human. So no matter how heinous the crime, any human could do it because we're human. Yeah. But choose love, choose mm -hmm. peace, choose faith, choose gratitude, choose hugs, choose all things good. And that's what comes back to you. It just is what it is. Mm -hmm. And remember, it is what you say it is. So be mindful of your words. Yes. That's what I would leave for you. And it's just the power of gratitude. You mm -hmm. have no idea how being thankful for who you are, what you are, where you are at this present moment in time can just take you to places that you've never been in such a beautiful way, but be thankful. Some people have this list of wants and needs and they're not even appreciative for the breath in their body and the fact that they woke up this morning, like I said, with, an app, with a chance to get it better today than you did, do it better than you did yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. They only thinking about what they don't have, what they want to have, what they need and it's like some people don't have legs here you are walking around give great give gratitude mm. some people no longer have breath in their body they can't get it right and they left here lost mm. you have choices every day to be the best version of yourself to be your best self every single day mm. right and be okay with being vulnerable now come on now i'm preaching to myself this is scary <laughs> place for me i ain't gonna lie I run up, run up, run. What do they say? Run up on the plug twice. I'll be out of here. Cause, and we think again, like I told you, we think we're guarding when we're blocking. Be mindful of what you're keeping out and what you're keeping in. Cause we have so much love to give. Just be okay with loving. You know what I mean? Be okay with being grateful. Be okay with where you are right now. Mm -hmm. And some people are like, oh, I don't know what God wants me to do. My life, I don't. You're exactly where you're supposed to be. Right. Right. Doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing right now. God is not a God of mistakes. He didn't say, oh, you know what? I'm going to make a mistake today. It's going to be my first one. I'm going to do it with Shronda. Right. <laughs> Why? He's not that God. He's not, he's not mm -hmm. making any mistakes. We beat ourselves up like, oh, I should have been wrote this book. I should have been started this job. I should have nine years ago. I should have kept playing and I would be in the NFL. Dude, you right where you're supposed to be. 
Because exactly. if it was meant to happen for you, it would. Stop beating mm -hmm. yourself up for old stuff that don't even have anything. It doesn't have anything to do with where God is taking you. Be right. okay and grateful for where you are so that doors may open mm -hmm. to take you to this beautiful destiny. And it may not look what you look like what you think it does, but it's all working out for your good. Yes, yes. Yeah. Right. Because again, he is the one that holds the key to everything. And we're not as powerful as we think we are. Mm -hmm. Again, if something was meant to happen, there would be absolutely nothing that could stop it if God wanted it to happen. And that's absolutely. things that we have to remind ourselves of again. Because if not, it's going to lead to that rabbit hole. Here we go. Oh, Lord, I'm 40 years <laughs> old and I ain't done nothing. Jesus. Right. Like, you know, right. Very, uh, every single one of us, we're exactly where we're supposed to be. Absolutely. Like we're we are. In trouble finding our purpose. Just be still. Oof. Just sit and be still. Go through each and every single day. Just taking oh, care yes. of time. Because he's I'm leading us. You. You uh, know, if you're the co creator, oh my gosh. Yes. Oh, you have to do is be listen. I'm sorry, Sharonda. Um, if you're the co-creator of your life, in every moment you get to think beautiful thoughts or imagine yourself doing what you love to do and just sitting, like simply sitting in it, closing your eyes and really seeing you driving this car, living in this particular place, speaking to children at a school, building your own school, yes. right? designing beautiful spaces, designing dope, you know, clothes, doing hair, makeup. Like it's so many ways that you could be of service and do what you love to do. And a lot of times we are the ones that's keeping things from happening. Like I said, we don't have faith. No. Uh, we don't believe it can happen for us. Why not? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. We come from the same creator. Right. We might not come from the same background, don't have the same, you know, family or bloodline. But one thing that ties us all together is the most high. Like we all come from the same God, the creator of all things that he has no respect of person. He's not going to favor you over me or vice versa. He's going to yeah. love us both. Want, he said he'll give you all the desires of your heart. A lot of times the reason we don't have it is because we don't believe we deserve it. We don't believe he do it for us. We don't believe we're mm -hmm. enough. No. Nope. But why not you? Why not me? Why? It's our belief system. Mm -hmm. You have to be mindful of your fears. Because a lot of times that's all it is. We just have fear that we wouldn't make it. Fear of failure. Fear of success. Like you want it, but you're too terrified that, oh no, because if I do this and this happen, what am I going to do? And what if people come after me? And what if people on social media say, first of all, you've created a whole scenario that isn't even real. Mm -hmm. You're putting your energy in places that this place doesn't even exist. You've created this negative space in your mind. So now the universe is carrying out what you've been thinking and feeling and all that stuff. But honestly, it's not real. Mm-hmm. Our mind lies to us 90% of the time. The yeah. brainstem holds on to these things that aren't even real. And it's trained us and conditioned us to believe things that aren't even real. I love this book by uh, Don Miguel Ruiz called um, The Voice of Knowledge. And that's mm -hmm. what it talks about. This voice that just lies. And we feed mm -hmm. into the lies. Okay, because this happened to me. She going to do this to me. Because this happened to me. He going to do this to me. Like... You've already accepted defeat and that person hasn't even had the opportunity to show themselves like they haven't had the opportunity to show you I'm different from your last girl. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm different from what you your last employee. I'm not going to be the same. You know, last girl. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm different from what you your last employee. I'm not going to be the same. You know what I mean? And so we really have to give we got to give life a chance. I'm going to say that because it's so much life to live. Um, in another couple months, I'll be 50 years old. And like, mm -hmm. I'm so gung ho about the next 50. Like what? Because I get to take all this love, this wisdom, this understanding, this intelligence, this creativity into another 50. And like now I'm not rushing to get anywhere. Like 
When you're young, you're like, ooh, and I can't wait till I turn 16. Oh, my super sweet 16. I can't wait to turn 18. Oh, now I'm legally a dope. Ooh, I can't wait to turn 21 so I can have a cocktail. I can't wait to turn 25. It's like, girl, you are rushing through life. You're missing it. Yes. You're yes. missing it. When I get up in the morning, I'd be like, okay, Chris, what adventure you want to have today? And then I just seek out to just do whatever it is I imagine that day. I'm going to eat my favorite foods and I'm going to go create a nice space and I'm going to wear this outfit and I'm always in the mode of creating. So I think everything is given to us and easy to come by, right? When we really believe that it's possible, Yes. right? It's possible. Any and everything is possible. You are created by the one that created it all. How is it impossible for you? Right. How? It's only impossible for you because you believe it's impossible for you. Not because he don't want to give it to you. It's there for the taking. What you waiting Mm -hmm. on? Mm -hmm. What you waiting on? Why you sitting here worried about, I ain't feel good yesterday. Girl, that was yesterday. How you feeling now? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm feeling so much better than I did yesterday. Let's go. That's how I'm thinking. You know what I'm saying? Let's go. What are we doing? You know, me and my girl, like spontaneity is a real thing. We're going to get up. We're going to leave the country. We're going to leave town. We're going to go for on a road trip. We're going to go to the spa, the 24-hour Korean spa. We're going to kick it. You know, like we're going to live life. You have this opportunity every day. Every time it comes, say thank you first and then ride it till the wheels fall off. That's what I say. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. 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 Sharonda, thank you so much for this opportunity. You've been so wonderful. Just let me just go on and on. (laughs) Enjoy speaking with you. This has been a beautiful conversation. Before we end everything, though, please tell everybody how they can connect with you, how they can learn more about you and your platform. Like your energy is just amazing. Thank you. You have a story to tell. And like I said, come on, God. It is meant to help other people. And that's what's so beautiful, just in hearing what you're saying and just how you've used your experience, like you said, to not just, you know, like I said, put out, oh, this is what I went through. And then, okay, what else? You offer that pot of gold. Like, this is get at the end of that rainbow. Mm Because you're right. We hold ourselves back because of what we think. It's not because there's anything in this world holding us back. Yes. We can achieve anything. And it and it does sound cliche if you really don't believe in yourself or you don't have a belief system at all. Yes. If you have a belief system, if you really believe in yourself, mm-hmm. you really understand anything is possible. Yes. Whatever you want to do in life, you can do it as long as you have breath in your body. Come on. Happen. So yes. I just appreciate your story and what you've given us in this conversation. So please tell everybody how they can connect with you. Okay, you guys, my website is christinasjohnson.com. That's where you can find everything, Christina, from my life coaching to my group coaching, the Quench Quest, to my mustard seed necklaces. Um, I have a workbook and a journal. I also, like I said, I'm an interior designer. So me and my business partner, Felia, have a company called Design My Investment. You can go to designmyinvestment.com. If you're looking for a designer, we do residential, we do commercial, we do corporate. So please go check us out. And it's Design My Investment on Instagram. My personal page is Christina Johnson underscore on Instagram, Christina Johnson on Facebook and Inner Peace. P-I-E-C-E, like a piece of furniture, on Twitter. I would love to get to know you, to meet you, DM me. Um, This has been amazing again, Sharonda. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, And I'll be praying for you. I know you're getting over your surgery. I pray pray that God just heals you completely and that you're better than you were before. He has that power. Just see it. It's done. Yes. So just start thinking. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Yes. Thank I love you it. so much. Like I said, I I love your energy so much. Just oh, thank you just for giving us that. We we all need healing right now. So yes. we we need to seek the healers. <laughs> when we have the healers that want to share their stories, it's just always a beautiful thing. Yeah. And just love hearing just getting this knowledge, you know, just yes. the way that it feeds the soul. So I just really appreciate you blessing us with this uh, with your platform and your journey and i'm just excited because i know everyone that listens to this conversation they're going to leave 
feeling higher. Gonna oh, feel- good. <laughs> and you know, there's so much going on in the world right now that I feel mm-hmm. like, you know, when you're God's kid, you can't be scared, right? Mm-hmm. I know it's a lot going on. It's like, wait, what's happening? UFOs being shot down and this and that. God said in the end times, people's hearts will fail because of fear. But my children, they have nothing to fear. You guys, we're okay. And just be okay with the fact that we're okay. Right? Just be okay. Like, he has us. We're good. We're good. Keep keep honoring him. Keep praising him. Keep enjoying your heartbeats. Right? We're good. So I just wanted to say that. I love you. I always say I love you. I love you. There's nothing you can do about it. And thank you. And I hope to come back again after the book yeah. comes. Have me back. I would love to talk to you about it further. Definitely. Thank okay. you so much. I'm glad. Ellie must have did this beat. <laughs>